All right, well, uh, my name is Josh, one of the pastors here at FC. I do have the great privilege of bringing us God's Word. Uh, We're in the middle of a new sermon series that we've titled The Slowest Activity. And uh, with this series, we're really exploring the process of how we change, uh, how we go from spiritual birth to spiritual maturity. Uh, And if you were here with us last week, you might remember we took a look at a working theory of change. And we saw that one of the ways that we can experience a profound and lasting kind of change and growth is as we surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit, especially through things like biblical teaching and healthy practices and robust community. Well, as we continue with our series, uh, today we'll be looking at the end goal of change. And we want to ask, at the end of the day, what's the final destination that God is seeking to bring us towards? At the end of the day, when all is said and done, what kind of people are we becoming? Well, as it's probably no surprise to many, if not most of us in this room, the end goal of change is to become more like Jesus. The end goal of change is greater Christ-likeness. That's where God is ultimately leading us, so that in our character, in our thinking, in our emotions, in the way that we speak, in the way that we live, in the way that we spend our time, in the way that we spend our money, in the way that we relate to the people around us, in the way that we carry out our jobs, in the way that we serve as parents, as sons, as brothers, as sisters, as daughters, we're to become more like Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself makes that pretty clear in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. There he's talking about what it means to be a disciple, someone who follows after him. And he says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Here, we see that Jesus desires to work in us and with us to produce the kind of change that leads us to looking more like Now, this is probably not breaking news for many of us. It's probably like, yeah, I've heard this before, especially for those of us who have grown up in the church. We know that the end goal of change is to become more like Jesus. And because we're so familiar with this idea, we might be tempted to kind of brush it aside, to rush past it kind of quickly. But I don't want us to just dismiss this reality so quickly. I want us to see what an immense privilege it is that God is at work in shaping us to become more and more like Christ. Because what that means is God is at work in our lives in this very moment to shape us to become more like the most beautiful and wise and gracious and kind and loving and courageous and just and and wonderful person that has ever lived. What a profoundly happy thought that is, that God is at work informing us to become more and more like Jesus. And so in seeing this end goal, my hope is that we would be so encouraged to pursue after the kind of change that God calls us to. Or to kind of put it this way, uh, there's a quote uh, that says, if you want to build a ship, don't just drum up people to collect wood and don't just assign them tasks and work, but if you want people to build a ship, teach them to yearn for the endless immensity of the sea. All right, last Sunday's sermon was all about the work, right? Here's how we can grow in greater Christ-likeness. Well, this sermon, today's sermon, the hope is that we would see what it means to become more like Jesus, that we would yearn for the endless immensity of that reality. And hopefully that encourages us because, again, change is hard. Uh, the reason why this sermon series is called The Slowest Activities is because very often change is the slowest activity. And in the slowness of this process, we can find ourselves getting discouraged, disgruntled. We can find ourselves resigning ourselves to thinking, okay, maybe this is just who I am. This is the way that I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And we can find ourselves finding it way more comfortable to just stay put, to hold on to our bad habits, to remain in our old addictions, to remain with our old behaviors. But in seeing who God is forming us to become, in seeing the end goal of looking more and more like Jesus, my hope is that we would yearn for the endless immensity of what that means. And so, what does it mean to look more like Jesus? What does it mean to be formed to look more like Christ? Well, there's a lot of different passages that we could look at, but I think one helpful place to begin is actually Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. See, in the first Psalm, in Psalm 1, we get a picture of this ideal person in God's kingdom. And we see that this is someone who is free from the entrapment of sin, for he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor does he stand in the way of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of mockers. We also see in Psalm 1 that this ideal person lives in accordance with God's word. Because his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, who is this person who is perfectly sinless, 
and perfectly obedient to God's word? Well, this is none other than Jesus, ultimately. Jesus is the ideal person in God's kingdom. And the beautiful reality is that that's where God is taking us. That's the end goal of change. So let me read for us just one verse. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to spend the bulk of this sermon just unpacking this one verse. It says this in Psalm 1, 3, where we get a beautiful image of what this final destination looks like. And it says this. It says, he, the ideal person in God's kingdom, Jesus, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. All right, so this is a picture of where God is taking us. God is forming us to look more and more like Jesus and to, to get us to see what a profound destination that is. Here, the psalmist uses this imagery of a tree in Psalm 1. And in using this image of a tree, the psalmist highlights four amazing things that God is aiming to do in our lives. Four amazing qualities that God is seeking to bring forth in our lives as he seeks to change us to look more like Christ. And the first thing that we see here is that in being changed to look more like Jesus, number one, we are positioned to thrive. We are positioned to thrive. Or as the psalmist puts it, we are planted by streams of water. We're planted by life-giving resources. Uh, as you might know, if you've ever tried to grow a tree, a fruit-bearing tree, you know that trees require a lot of water. And we see here that this particular tree is not just scattered anywhere, it's not just placed in any old random spot, but it's planted by streams of water. That means that for us, God has carefully planted us by the life-giving resources that we need to thrive. That means that we're not just randomly placed anywhere, but there is a deliberate and intentional and thoughtful and loving care in terms of where we are planted. God handpicks the perfect spot for us for the sake of our maturity and our growth into greater Christ-likeness. And those surrounding circumstances can look different from person to person and from season to season. And for some of us, in some seasons, we will experience growth as God plants us in places where we are ready to receive we receive encouragement and counsel. We receive uh, discipleship and training. We receive uh, wisdom from other people. We receive as others deeply pour into us, and we experience growth. But for other seasons, we will experience growth as we're put in a position to deeply pour into others. Rather than receiving so much, God calls us to, to give our wisdom, to give our encouragement, to give our love, to give our care, to open up our doors, our wallets, our lives. And in so doing, we begin to mature and grow into greater Christ-likeness. And for other seasons, we will experience growth through deep pain and suffering. We'll actually talk more about this next Sunday as we explore the, the role of suffering when it comes to, to change and becoming more like Christ. But don't miss this. In God's work of changing us to become more and more like Jesus, every season is for our growth and our benefit. Every life circumstance is for the sake of our thriving. It's not just those times and seasons when we feel like we're being poured into. It's not just those times and seasons when it feels like everything is working out smoothly. But it's also, and perhaps especially those times and seasons, when we are pouring into others and when things are really difficult and hard. In every season, we are being positioned to thrive. Now I know, for a lot of us in this room, we look at where we are at in life right now, and this does not seem to be the case. Maybe we feel stuck. Maybe we feel spiritually dry. Maybe we yearn to be in a different season. Maybe we look at our friends, other church members, like, man, I want to be where they're at. But we can take heart knowing that where we are right now is no accident. The season and the time and the circumstances that you find yourself in is no accident. Rather, God has intentionally placed you in the exact spot that you need to be, at least for this season, for the sake of your growth and your maturity. You're not just randomly scattered somewhere. No, you're planted by streams of water. So what that means is you can actually embrace any and every season because under God's care, there are no wasted seasons. And all of that is aimed for our flourishing, for an abundant life. Right, we're positioned to thrive. You know, I love what Jesus says in John chapter 10. He says, I have come that they, his disciples, that they may have life and that they may have life abundantly. This is the kind of life that God is leading us to by planting us along streams of water. He desires us to have a life that is abundant, a life that is overflowing, a life that is thriving. This is the kind of life that is marked with a deep and abiding peace, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. 
This is the kind of life that is filled with a genuine sense of gratitude, whether you have much or whether you have very little. This is the kind of life that is free from jealousy and envy and constant comparison with others. This is the kind of life that overflows with a joyful intimacy that is found in being fully known and fully loved by God and by others. And this is where God is taking us. In being changed to become more like Jesus, we are being positioned to thrive. That's the first thing. Well, secondly, number two, we see here that in being changed to look more like Jesus, we develop godly character in order to bless others. We develop godly character in order to bless others. Or as the psalmist puts it, we will bear fruit in due season. We will grow and develop Christ-like character, which the Bible elsewhere calls the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, as God is at work in your life to change you to become more like Jesus, he's going to cultivate things in you such as love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Just to kind of briefly run through these godly character traits, starting with love. Here's a simple definition. Love is seeking the good of the other, even at a cost to oneself. Love entails dying to yourself, your preferences, your priorities, your comforts, your needs, for the sake of bringing life to others. And of course, this is perfectly demonstrated by Jesus himself, who at the cross bears the greatest cost to himself for the sake of our greatest good. Love is dying to ourselves for the sake of others. Next is joy. This is what God is seeking to produce in you. Joy is an unchanging delight in God despite our changing circumstances. Joy is the consistent and growing enjoyment of God in all of his goodness and beauty and glory, regardless of everything else that's going on in your life. See, Christian joy is not conditioned. It's not a conditional happiness that's based upon our circumstances. But Christian joy is rooted in the unchanging character of God, regardless of our circumstances. Next is peace. Peace is a confidence that rests in the wisdom and sovereignty of God. This is a sense of of well-being that comes from trusting in God. Now, this peace is not being naive. It's not being indifferent. It's not downplaying things. It's not ignoring things. It's recognizing, okay, this is the reality that's surrounding my life, but it's a deep rest that comes from a deep trust, knowing that God is sovereign that God is working all things together for my good. It's a peace that places its confidence in God. Next is patience. Patience is the ability to endure suffering without blowing up. And how many of us parents need this, especially? Patience is the ability to endure suffering without blowing up. It's the quality of mind that enables us to take everything inside, uh, in stride and to not be so easily offended. It's the ability to put up with others and to endure through tough circumstances with a resilient joy rather than a nagging resentment. Next is kindness. Kindness is a deep compassion for others out of a deep inner security. Uh, Kindness is not just a sentimentality. It's not just virtue signaling, but this is a genuine concern for the well-being of others. And as such, kindness is the ability to genuinely celebrate with others in their success. Kindness is the ability to genuinely grieve with others in their mourning because kindness is deeply secure in God. It's it's free to deeply care for others. Next is goodness. Goodness is integrity of character in all situations. It's a consistent Christ-likeness no matter the circumstances, whether in public or in private, whether in the home or in the workplace, whether by yourself or you're hanging out with the boys. That's goodness. The opposite of goodness is a phoniness or a hypocrisy. It's pretending to be one thing in front of others, but then being something completely different behind closed doors. True goodness remains true to character, no matter the context. A few more to go. Next is faithfulness. Faithfulness is being trustworthy and true in relating to others. It encompasses being loyal, being reliable, being true to one's word, following through on one's promises. Faithfulness refuses to be a fair-weather friend who pulls away when the costs outweigh the benefits. Faithfulness refuses to be opportunistic, taking advantage of a situation. Rather, faithfulness sticks around and can be counted on even in the toughest of times. Next is gentleness. Gentleness is using one's strength in service to others. Oftentimes, we think of gentleness as an inferiority complex. Oh, I'm not that great. I'm not that smart. We allow others to step all over us. But that's not gentleness. True gentleness recognizes, man, I have a lot to offer. God's blessed me with all kinds of strengths and gifts and abilities and experiences. And I want to use those things, not for my own benefit, but for the sake of others. Those who are gentle recognize their strength, and they use their strength to serve others. Lastly is self-control. 
Self-control is godly discipline over one's life. It's a mastery of your desires and your passions so that you're able to choose that which is right, that which is good, that which is pleasing in God's sight. The opposite of self-control is an impulsive person who is ruled by their own fluctuating desires, who's ruled by the the needs of the changing circumstances. Rather, self-control exercises discipline over one's life so that you end up what is doing right in God's eyes. So this is the kind of fruit that we will bear as God grows us to become more like Jesus. God is at work to grow us to become the kind of people who are marked by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's the fruit. And here's the thing about fruit. Fruit is not primarily meant for the tree to enjoy. Fruit is primarily meant for others to enjoy. The fruit that we bear in our character is not primarily for our own benefit. This is not a self-help religiosity. No, this is primarily for the benefit of others. You've probably experienced what a blessing it is when you come across someone who is so full of the fruit of the Spirit. See, as we develop Christ-like character, we become a breath of fresh air for others. We become a pillar of wisdom and stability for others. We become a safe place of of love and understanding for others. We bless others by being the kind of person that God has called us to become. And that is where God is taking us, to be people who are filled with the fruit of the Spirit and being changed to become more like Jesus. We develop godly character to bless others. That's the second thing. Two more to go. Thirdly, we see that in being changed to look more like Jesus. Number, uh, Number three, we are able to persevere through all seasons of life. We're able to faithfully make it through all seasons of life. Or as the psalmist puts it, our leaf does not wither. Our leaf does not wither. Even in the deepest struggles of life, there is this enduring resilience that we exhibit. There is this steadfast tenacity that just does not know how to quit. And of course, this is perfectly embodied by Jesus himself. I mean, I think of Jesus at probably the lowest point in his life. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that in a few hours, he will be facing the cross. And in this garden, he is just wrestling with the Father. He says, Father, please, if there is any other way, please remove this cup from me. Jesus fully knows what he's about to step into. He knows that in a few hours, he will be bearing the wrath of God for the sake of the sins of his people. And that causes him to tremble. It stresses him out so badly that he begins to bleed blood out of his pores. He knows what's in store. And yet, Jesus has the courage to pray, yet not my will, but your will be done. Despite all that he is about to face, despite the fact that he will be betrayed by one of his disciples, he will be denied by one of his closest friends, he will be unjustly treated by the governing authorities, he'll be unfairly mocked by the crowds, he will face a horrendous and cruel murder by crucifixion, he will face the holy wrath of God poured out on him. Despite all of those things, nevertheless, Jesus' leaf does not wither. He's able to move forward with an unwavering confidence and a deep sense of purpose. He knows that through it all, he is profoundly secure in the will of God. And that's the kind of resilience and perseverance that God seeks to grow in us. And how we need this. A few weeks ago during our anniversary service, if you remember, our guest speaker, Pastor Harold, he mentioned uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek that, that our generation, the younger generations, my generation included, millennials, um, we're one of the generations that are the least equipped to deal with suffering and pain and hardship. And I think he's right. As hard as, hard as that is to admit, I think he's right. I mean, so often for, for us, we run at the sight of, of, um, of difficulties and hardships. For often for us, at the slightest moment of inconvenience, you say, ah, it's not for me. And that's in all sorts of contexts, whether it's in the context of relationships, in the context of our jobs, in the context of ministry responsibilities, in the context of church community, we have such a hard time being resilient in the face of challenges and difficulties. And yet, God desires something far better for us. God desires us to grow, to become the kind of people who can persevere through all seasons of life. Just to give a concrete picture of what this might look like, when I think of someone whose leaf does not wither, I think of my grandpa on my mom's side. Um, He's passed away, it's been many years now. Uh, But as he was nearing the end of his life in his mid-90s, those final few years and months were really difficult, as it is for anyone that's that old very often. 
It's hard because at that age, your body hurts. It doesn't function the way that you're used to it functioning. Uh, you've lost most of your teeth, so even something as uh, simple and fundamental as eating is difficult. Uh, something like going to the bathroom on your own is nearly impossible. Uh, it's just a very difficult place to be. And yet, as I saw him in his final years of life, there was a resilience that kept him going even in the midst of much pain. There was a deep trust in God that carried him until the very end. And even on his deathbed, as he was surrounded by his children and his grandchildren, there was no bitterness, there was no resentment, there was no sense of regret, but there was a deep and abiding confidence that soon I'm going to see my heavenly father. Soon I will arrive home. And I don't know about you, but if I'm able to make it to 95, 96, I want to be that kind of person, a person who exhibits that kind of resilience, someone whose leaf has not withered. The good news is that's where God is taking us. He desires for us to persevere through all seasons. That's the third thing. Lastly, number four, we see that in being changed to look more like Jesus. Number four, we are effective. We will be effective in our God-given callings will be effective and fruitful in our God-given callings. Or as the psalmist puts it, we will prosper in all that we do. Or having set our hearts to follow after God, having set our hearts to faithfully do what God has called us to do, we will find true success. Success as God defines it, not as how the world defines it. Now, just to be clear, uh, this does not mean that every business venture or every plan of ours will come to fruition. Uh, that, that's not what God is guaranteeing here. Rather, the Christ-like person is faithful to do the things that God has entrusted them to do. And as they faithfully carry out God's purposes for their lives and their generation, God will bring forth eternal and lasting fruit. All those things will endure into eternity. And that's so important for us to hold on to. And I think, especially as we find ourselves living in such a results-oriented culture, at work we're, we're told to give our quarterly reports, we have to meet certain benchmarks, we have to reach certain productivity goals, with our kids, we want them to reach certain milestones by a certain age, or we freak out, like, oh my gosh, my kid is six months, he's not talking in full sentences yet, and we freak out. With our finances, with our fitness, we like to see certain gains within a certain amount of time. We live in such a results-oriented culture, but when it comes to obeying God's call on our lives, results won't always seem so apparent, and maybe you've experienced this personally in your own life. Maybe you've spent countless hours praying for your dad or your mom to come to faith. And it feels like their heart is just as hardened as it was five years ago. Maybe you sought to be a really good neighbor. You've opened up your home, been generous with your time, been generous with your resources, but it feels like, man, they're, they're no, not any closer to knowing who Jesus is. And the tendency for us is to look at the lack of results and just call it quits. It's not a call to just blindly keep pressing on. There's wisdom in evaluating things and making necessary changes. But what I'm pinpointing is this tendency to relinquish obedience to God in the face of seeming fruitlessness. But the beautiful reality is, in God's kingdom, no investment ever returns empty or void. In God's kingdom, obedience will always bear fruit. But even more than that, in God's kingdom, obedience will bear more fruit than we could even expect. And that's because in our work, God himself is at work, and God will bring forth unbelievable and unexpected and disproportionate fruit from our obedience. And of course, this is perfectly demonstrated by Jesus himself. Jesus faithfully carried out God's call on his life by going to the cross. Now to the world, dying on a cross seemed like utter failure. There was no more shameful way to die in the Roman world than to be crucified on a cross. But in God's kingdom, dying on a cross was the pinnacle of success. Jesus effectively fulfilled God's call on his life, and we are the beneficiaries of that. That act of obedience has led to everlasting fruit, and that's where God is taking us. And being changed to look more like Jesus, we will be effective in our God-given callings. All right, so that's the end goal of change, to become more like Jesus. And in becoming more like Jesus, that involves being positioned to thrive, that involves developing godly character, that involves persevering through all seasons, and that involves being effective in our God-given callings. That's where God is taking us. And the great hope and guaranteed promise that we have is that one day, one day, we will fully become like Jesus. If you look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, last uh, passage we'll look at very briefly. Uh, the Apostle John promises this. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, 
we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. This is our great hope and promise, that one day when Jesus returns, and he will return, one day when we finally see Jesus face to face, we will be as he is. Our character will match his character. Our lives will match his life. Our thoughts will match his thoughts. Who we are will be like who he is. And so the encouragement and application as we wrap up our sermon for today is to keep fixing your eyes on Jesus. In other words, behold Jesus to become more like Jesus. Look at Jesus, and in so doing, look more like Jesus. We become what we behold. It's a similar process to uh, if you've been dating someone for a long time or if you've been married for a long time, you've been friends with someone for a long time, you begin to look like the other person. You begin to pick up on their mannerisms, their sense of humor, their sense of style. You begin to look like them as you look at them. And that same process takes place as we behold Christ. And so behold Jesus to become more like Jesus. Look to Jesus in his word. Read, meditate, memorize scripture and recognize his ways, his character, his promises, his heart. See Jesus in his word. Look to Jesus in the work of his hands. We can catch a glimpse of who Jesus is in his creative work. So enjoy a hike in nature. Right? Take a walk on the beach. Enjoy music and good food. Enjoy the sunrise. Enjoy the night sky. See Jesus in his works. Also, see Jesus in his people. Surround yourself with people who bear the fragrance and the aroma of Christ. See how Jesus is like as you surround yourself with brothers and sisters who are trying to reflect Jesus' character and let their life be an encouragement to you. But above all, see Jesus in the gospel. Reflect again and again and again each day on the gospel. For it is at the cross where we see the clearest picture of who Jesus is. So to see Jesus in the gospel. And as you behold Christ in these ways, Look forward to the day when you will behold Christ face to face. And in so doing, hold on to the hope that on that day, you will finally become fully like him. This is where God is taking us. And I hope that in seeing the endless immensity of what that means, I hope that we are encouraged to persevere even in the face of challenges and difficulties, even in the face of the slowest activity of change. It's worth it because we're growing to become more like Jesus. If you can bow your heads with me at this time, we'll spend some time in prayer and reflection as we respond to God's word together. Um, Just take a moment to to behold Christ, um, to see Jesus in the fullness of his goodness and beauty and wisdom and patience and loving kindness and mercy and grace. Just take a moment to reflect on where God is taking you and then beholding Jesus would that stir in you a renewed conviction to pursue after the change that God desires for you church let's spend some time in prayer as we respond and reflect on God's word together let's pray at this time